it's not about the file. We'll be using the file. Did I start recording? More. I think I might have said record on this computer. Darn it. Okay, so yeah, over in Learning Suite, we got a file to download. We'll talk about that file. But today, we are, we are beginning a topic. We'll spend two days on this topic, and the topic is arrays. So arrays are, are a, like a general idea in a lot of different programming languages. So just by a show of hands, how many of you already can use arrays? Oh, a few of you. I know I can. Every time I get a paycheck, I look at it and say, boy, I sure can use arrays. There's not that many jokes available, you know, in the programming context, so I'll, we'll take what we can get. So, um, most, uh, I'm gonna tell you about my first experience with arrays. So my father, did I tell you my father was a programmer? I learned to program from my father. Did I tell you this? Have I told you this before? So, <clears throat> in 1979, um, we were visiting my Uncle Jim's house in Salt Lake, big house in the avenues in Salt Lake where I was raised in San Diego. We were here for the summer. And, uh, I, and, and my dad wakes me up one morning. And you know, he, he opened the door to the room, I was sleeping in the basement, in the bedroom in the basement, and he opened the door and he said, son, the house is on fire, and the fire, the fire department has asked us to evacuate the building. Um, my father's not a, not a prankster, not a jokester, so I knew that he was serious. Uh, and sure enough, you know, I, I came out of the house, and there's fire trucks, and they're spraying water on the house, house on fire. Uh, at the time, my father was a general contractor, and Uncle Jim then hired my dad to remediate the fire damage on his house. Um, and as part of the payment, Uncle Jim taught my dad how to program. So uh, Uncle Jim was brilliant. He's dead now, died from Parkinson's disease, but he, he, he was a brilliant, absolutely brilliant programmer. Uh, my dad, not so much. Um, but after Uncle Jim taught him how to how to program, he then hired him after, you know, he went and worked in Silicon Valley for, I don't know, maybe a dozen years or so while I was growing up. Maybe probably not that long. <clears throat> and so um, he was an okay programmer. He was not a very good teacher. And the combination sometimes was really, really painful, as it was when I was first being exposed to the idea of an array. And so he tried, to, he tried to explain what an array was using, using metaphors. So he said, arrays are like pigeonholes. And the truth is, I had no idea what a pigeonhole was. So the, array, the, the metaphor wasn't helping me. And we probably went at that for about a half hour, and it was clear that I wasn't getting it. So okay, forget the pigeonholes. It's like post office boxes. Now, I had probably been to the post office, I'm, I'm like 12. I've been to the post office a time or two, you know, but it's not a regular occurrence for me. And I, I, I was raised in rural San Diego County. And so when he said post office boxes, I'm thinking of like the mailbox sticking on a, on a stick in the front of the house. And we didn't have them in the front of our house because it was really rural, you know. So like at the end of the road, there's a whole bunch of these mailboxes and they're all tilted, you know, sideways. There's no order. There's really no, not very much order to them at all. And so we spent about a half hour with that metaphor and I just was completely clueless. By, by the end of an hour, you know, I, I was in tears. I thought, you know, oh, I'm a moron. My dad was in tears. He thought, I, my son's a moron. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't get it. I, I went away from that thing. I guess I will never ever understand what an array is. Ah, so I, I, I always tell that story when I get here to remind myself that this is not especially easy. This is not a really intuitive thing that, that we're going to do. <laughs> Um, but you're in luck because I am a good programmer and a really good teacher. <laughs> so we're going to get you going on the right, on the right foot. One of the most amazing things, uh, and I think even our book may suffer from this, is that um, every place I've ever seen arrays explained, we, we, they talk about it as if, as if it's, it's enough to say this is an array, but it's not. I mean, array is a word in, in the programming lingo. And if you kind of look up, if you try to Google the definition of array, you'll find a definition that's specific to computer programming. But there's an English definition of the word. What does it mean? What's an array? You know, get your little fingers going on Google and someone coming with a definition. Someone find a definition of an array. You'll get a gold star. You give me, if you find a definition that I like, it should be pretty easy to get there. What do you got? An impressive display or range 
Hmm, that's pretty good. I might go with that one. Let's see if there's another one. Go ahead. An ordered series. I like the impressive, or say it again. An impressive range of a particular type of thing. I, you know, I like that example. Don't lose that. I might ask it for you three or four more times today during the session. So, does it make sense in English for me to stand over here in the corner of this room and look out across this whole room and say, my, what a wonderful array I see. Does that make sense? An array of what? That's the question. An array of what? You know, so, 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 so tell me, what, 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 what array could I be seeing, viewing from this vantage point in the room? I could see a, an array. What a beautiful array of chairs. You can go with chairs. That would work. There's an array of chairs here. Of, of students, of people, of desks, of computers. You know, it's a, say it again. An, uh, yeah, an impressive display of a particular type of thing. You know, it's a, it is a, it's a bunch of a particular kind of thing. And so in programming, when we say we have an array, you're not done. You have to say it's an array of what? It's an array of what? It's not an array of numbers. So an array is, say it again. An impressive array or range is a tough one because range means something specific in VBA. An impressive, let's see it, an impressive display of a particular kind of thing. And the particular kind of thing that we're talking about in VBA when we say array is we are saying it is an impressive display of variables. So when we're talking about arrays, we're talking about an array of variables. Someone remind me what a variable is. Maybe you've studied the, the uh, little slideshow that we had on variables um, like on the second or third day of class. You know, and there's this, the first slide, an array is what? A location in memory with a name. Beautiful, that's what a variable is. And so when I say I have an array, I am talking about, I, I, have, a, I have an impressive display. I've got a, a large group, I've got a, a group of what? Variables, named locations in memory. That's what it is. And so the idea here is that, listen, I'm gonna need a whole potload of variables. I don't wanna to have to declare them one at a time. Instead, I wanna make an array of variables. I wanna declare 500 variables with one statement. And, and, and we can do that if we make an array of variables. Arrays have a type just like, 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 like variables do. In fact, when you make an array of variables, all the variables in that array are of the same type. That's not necessarily true in all languages. Within VBA, it is. I have an array of these variables. They are all of the same data type. Okay, so why don't we just kind of take a peek at um, how we would declare an array. We'll fiddle with it, and then we'll look at an example that we'll start to build for today. So I've downloaded this file, starwood.xlsm. I'm gonna open it up, I think. And, but first, before we kind of look at the, the data that's here, I'm just gonna come and insert a module. So starwood, insert, module, sub, I'm just gonna call this initialize. If I wanted to make one variable of type integer, how would I do it? Dim x as integer. If I want to make an array of integer variables, all I have to do is right after the x, I put in parentheses a number. And now I haven't created one, I have created, it's a trick question. I haven't just created one, I have created, you can yell out the number that you think it's right, it'll be wrong. 50, I have not created 50. How many have I created? No, no, I, I have created a bunch of variables. It's not 50, and it's not 49, but you're oh so close, 51. And the reason that it's 51 is because the first one is number zero. X sub zero equals 44 debug.print x sub zero comma x sub one. What do I expect to get here? X sub one. What, what do you think? Tell, tell me what you think. Tell me any part of what you think that's gonna print. It will print 44. So this, this is gonna print 44 and what will this print? Should print zero. 
right? Because now, first of all, is there a variable x sub one? Yeah, there is. I haven't put a value into it, but because it's an integer, it's a numeric variable, it's gonna start off with zero. So we should get, did I click that? I must have clicked that twice. So we, we, we get those. So I have created 51 variables because this is actually the top index. It's not the number of variables. Most languages, this is the number of variables you want. But I'm creating the top index. So I should also be able to ask here number 50. And I should do the same thing because 50 is not yet declared. Or it's declared, but it's not assigned a value. Oh, my mouse must be like it's clicking extra. It's extra enthusiastic. Now, what happens if I try to do 51? Is there a variable number 51? There's a variable number zero, number one, number two, all the way through 50. So what do you think? It'll be a runtime error. Excellent. Syntactically, we're valid because, you know, this is identifying an array. We have an index here. That's what it's looking for. Um, but when it tries to execute that, it's going to go subscript out of range. What's the valid range for the subscript for this array? Zero to 50. Zero to 50. Okay. So, so far you think, wow, that's, maybe that's not too bad. Well, why would you do this? Well, the whole reason that we do this is not so we can index these with literals, but so that we can index these with uh, variables. So let me just dim, uh, let me dim y as an integer and say y equals input box. This is a really, this is a kind of a really pointless example, but you'll see the point. You'll, you'll, you would never actually write code like this, but this will demonstrate what I'm looking for. I-N-P-U-T-B-O-X. Enter a number between zero and 50. Okay, so after this line executes, y will hold that number. And so now I can put y as the integer here. So, so I can use another variable to decide which of these 51 variables I'm interested in. And the ability to do this is what makes arrays really powerful. So I'll run this, enter a number from one to 50. I'll put in two. And that should print out two zeros for me. Oh, the, my 51 is still here, thank you. Like, let me just print out just the one that we have here. Yeah, so it'll always be two unless I put in the zero here because that's the one that I've given the value to and that's printed the 44. Oof. Okay, are you ready for me to introduce the problem that we're gonna to try to solve today? Suppose that you have, you, you've just been hired by the Starwood Corporation. Starwood Corporation, by the way, is a real company. Uh, and it is a, uh, it's in the hospitality industry. There are several, they have several brands that you have heard of, uh, of hotels. So the Sheridan, you've heard of the Sheridan? We have one in, in Salt Lake. You've heard of the, the Westin. You've probably heard of Four Points. Anyway, you know, they, this is the parent company for all these hotel chains that you're familiar with. So, you've just been hired by the Western Regional Office, and you know your your new boss says, "Listen, nobody knows we've hired you. It's a big secret." And so, here's what I want you to do: you got three months before you start, um, before you actually show up here at the office. But during that time, I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's a month. I don't know how long it is. But before you come here, I want you to go to you know these 36 properties. Some of these we think are doing really well. And some of these we think are not doing so well at all. And I want you to go and, and, and just, just study them. You know, we're gonna, I'll give you, we'll give you a credit card and you know, just eat at the restaurants, stay there, you know, whatever. And you know, we'll cover all of your expenses. And you, know, you say, well, that sounds great, but you know, that's a really long road trip. I'd hate to be away from my family for that long. No problem, bring your family, use the card, rent a van and take the family with you, you know? And when you get there, I mean, do everything. Go, you know, go to the pool, uh, the, the uh, exercise room, the masseuse, make sure you go spend some time with the masseuse, and, you know, just kind of keep notes, and then come back and give us a report, tell us how we're doing, you know, on these particular set of properties. So you say, great. This sounds like a pretty good way to start. I don't know, you might think that's a terrible thing, but maybe, maybe it's not too bad, I don't know. 
So your next question is, hey, what order do you want me to go to these in? And what does he say? What, is, what, is, what does she say? What does your boss say? I don't care. Just before you show up, go to them all. Okay, so now you are going to decide what order to go to these 36, is it 35 or 36? I think it's 36 properties. <clears throat> tell me, don't tell me the actual order, but tell me something that describes the order you prefer. So geographical by location. I like that. We're headed where I'm headed, but. Okay, yeah, you'd like this to be the shortest route possible. You'd like to spend as little time driving. That's right, yeah, because every hour you're on the road in the van with the kids is one hour less with the masseuse, right? Or the pool, yeah. So that's what you want. You want the shortest possible route. You've got to go to every single one of these. You want the shortest possible route. Well, this is, this is a famous problem. Anyone know the name of this problem? You know, like what, how they describe this problem, you know, when they talk, when they write about this problem academically. And we've been writing about this problem academically for hundreds of years. Tra yeah, it's called the traveling salesman problem. So in this case, it's a traveling hotel reviewer problem, but it's the same problem. I mean, traveling salesman got to go to all these different places. It doesn't matter the order he goes to them in, but you know, how do you figure out the shortest route? <laughs> Mathematicians spend their careers on this problem. There is only one known solution, only one known algorithm that is guaranteed to give you the shortest route. Any idea what it is? You know, what algorithm could you do, kind of apply to this and say, run that algorithm and that will give us the shortest route? Go ahead. Yeah, that's it. It is calculate every single pos every, every possible route you calculate how long that route takes and pick the shortest one. That's it. So, yeah, you know, and, you know, so by the way, why do, if we have a solution, why do mathematicians spend their careers on this problem? Because it's kind of a hard problem to solve when you solve it that way. Let's just look at how hard it is real quick. Okay. So I thought I would solve this, this very problem. I thought I would solve um, with a computer once, not too long ago. Well, we'll just let it run. We've got time. Let it run. How many, by the way, how many properties do we have? I forget. It's either 35 or 36. Uh, where are we? Uh, so we've got properties. I'm not sure those are the right ones. This for sure is it. 36. Okay, we've got 36 properties. So the question is, how many different routes are there? Don't tell me the number, but tell me how you figure out the number. Yeah, 36 factorial. I'm always amazed that someone has it on the top of their tongue. The first time I figured out it was 36 factorial, it took me a good 10 minutes to realize, oh, it's just 36 factorial. Fortunately, we have a fact function. Fact 36. You know, I was never that good with scientific notation, so let's put this into something that I can read. I mean, I did scientific notation, you know, when I was like in high school. But... Uh, oh, here we go. Comma, and we don't need the decimal points on the end. That's how many different routes there are. So I thought, well, let's just figure out how long it takes. Well, the truth is I, I set it to run overnight. I, I wrote an algorithm that would go figure out every possible route. I set it to run overnight and it wasn't anywhere near being done in the morning. But I wonder how long it takes. So I timed myself on my computer and it was taking uh, 5,000 routes per second. Oh, that's pretty good. So how many seconds will this take? That's a lot of seconds. Minutes, hours, days, years, equals this divided by 365.25. So many years it would take my computer to solve this problem. My computer is not going to solve this problem. Okay, so I read not too long ago, I read in PC Magazine that the one billionth PC had been produced. So why don't we use that as kind of a surrogate for humanity's processing capability. So I'm going to divide this. I'm just, we're going to put every computer in the world on this. Divide this by 1 billion. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's how many years it will take if 
we dedicate all of humanity's computing processing to it to solve this to solve this one problem. Which route? Should, you could drive the worst route faster than you can calculate the fastest route. You really could by a long ways. Um, okay, I don't even know how to talk about that number. What is that? Uh, best scientific estimate for how old the universe is. You know, about twenty billion years. Finally, that's a number I can say. That's thousands, millions, billions, trillions. To solve this problem and be sure that I have the right solution, it will take 117 trillion times as long as the universe has been in existence if I put all of my computing processing power at it. That's the only way to be certain that I've got the right answer. Is that crazy? The problem is pretty simple, 36 properties. And what do I have here? I mean, I've got the, I've got the building blocks for this because I've got, I know the road distances. Uh, yeah, this, this, is, this is road distances between each of these properties. So mathematicians spend their time on this because they're trying to figure out, you know, there's, there are vast segments of this problem space that you can be relatively certain aren't, don't hold the best solution. And so, they're trying to figure out, you know, how can we, how can we do this? How can we be relatively sure that we've got the best route? Um, by the way, who's interested in this problem? Who's interested in, I mean, not in this classroom. I know none of you are really interested in this problem in this classroom. But, I mean, what, what, what businesses are interested in this problem? Go ahead. Yeah, so the answer was, you know, basically anyone in supply chain. But if you look at someone like UPS or Federal Express, that's what they do, right? We've got this truck. It's got to go delivering all these deliveries. And what, what order does it, do they have to go on? Doesn't matter. Just got to get them all there, you know, by whatever time they're supposed to get them there by. Um, but the problem becomes even more complex in that space because a left-hand turn is way more expensive than a right-hand turn if you're driving a UPS van. Um, for two reasons. It's more expensive because it takes longer to turn left because you have to go across traffic and it's more dangerous. So you're more likely to get in a wreck if you turn across traffic. And so it's not just enough to know the distances, but you've got to start anticipating, well, how many left turns does that route have and, and so forth. So we are, as you might have guessed, we are not going to solve this problem today. But what our, what our goal is today and uh, next Monday is going to be to write a an algorithm in VBA that will give us a reasonable route. You know, not, we don't care if it's the best route. In fact, we all accept the fact that it probably isn't the best route, but it'll be a reasonable route. So let's talk about it. How, just, you know, kind of in English, tell me how we might go about calculating a pretty good route. That was a scratch. I thought it was a volunteer. Yeah, go ahead. Why don't we do this? The, the closest hotel is in Salt Lake. It's the Sheridan in Salt Lake. Let's, let's take that as our given starting point. So, find the next closest. So, that's the starting point. You find the one that's closest to that, and then the one that's closest. Oh, okay. So, find the one that's closest to Salt Lake. I know, I happen to know that one. It is the one, there's one, only one property up here that's in Las Vegas. Okay, so you say, go to Salt Lake, find the closest one. Go to Las Vegas. And then you say, find the closest one to that. Yeah, yeah, because, it, because the closest one to that is also Salt Lake. I'll bring it right back here. Okay, so you're, the algorithm you just described is take some starting point, find the closest one to that, and then from there, find the closest one that you haven't been to yet. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty reasonable algorithm. That's the one that I'd like to implement here in class today. That has a name. It's called the Next Nearest City Algorithm. Now, that doesn't quite work for us because we have some hotels that are in the same city. We've got several that are in Los Angeles. So we'll call it the Next Nearest Hotel Algorithm. Um, yeah, and, it's, and, and you described that pretty, pretty quickly, right? I mean, it didn't take you long to describe it. Start somewhere, go to the closest one, and then from there, go to the closest one you haven't been to, and then repeat until you've gotten all the list. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so could we, could we put those, those constraints into solver? And what, we have, what we've just described are not constraints. We've described an algorithm. And so if they were just constraints, yeah, we could, but solver is not going to touch this. By the way, about, about how big of a problem can we solve computationally? Does anyone know? How do you know? 
It's about 25 properties. If you, have, if you have 25 properties, it's heavy lifting to solve it, but it's solvable. 26, no longer solvable, um, just, just in terms of what, what kind of power it takes to be able to do it. So, um, so and, and, we're, and, we're, and we're going to do this by making great use of arrays, as you might have guessed, and that's our topic for today. All right, so let's go ahead and, those numbers look kind of like Montana to me. I don't know. Maybe the route should go through Montana. I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any properties in Montana. Okay, so let's go ahead then and let's, let me get a little bit familiar with the array. So instead of this example that we have here, let's create an array just to hold the names of our hotels. Might be kind of nice to have those hotels sitting in an array that we can refer to them directly. So I'm gonna call that hotel. Dim hotel as string. Okay, I've just created one hotel, one variable called hotel. Now I need to have enough to handle all of my different hotels. So what do I do? How do I make this from one variable into the right number of variables? Yeah, just right after hotel in parentheses, I put 35. I'm, I'm making hotels that go from zero to 35. So I've got 36 now variables. And so here, you know what I'm gonna do? Instead of declaring this here, this is the only place we've ever declared a variable so far, is inside a subprocedure. The other place I can declare a variable is outside the subprocedure at the top of the module. All right. I don't think it, can go, it can't go before the option. Options have to be at the very top, and then I can have some, declare, some, some variable declarations. By the way, interestingly, in the world of basic, in the early days, you only ever used the word dim when you were making an array. And variables you just started to use and it would, it would allocate the memory for them. And then as, as, as Visual Basic or as, as Basic started to grow up, they said, you know, it'd be kind of nice if we could actually declare a single variable. And so they said, well, you know, we've got something that declares a bunch of variables. So what should we use? We'll use the same statement to declare a single variable. So it kind of happened backwards in the way you might have thought of it. They had something to declare a single variable and they just <laughs> adapted it. So in fact, dim is short for dimension. And, it, and, and dimension makes more sense if you're talking about an array of variables, you're dimensioning it. Right now we're only looking at a single dimensional array, but we can have multiple dimension arrays and we'll get there. Now, why might I declare a variable at the top of the module instead of inside a subprocedure? Go ahead. Right, yeah, so the, so the answer is, if it's declared out here, this variable now has module level scope, which means any subprocedure inside this module can refer to that directly. So every other variable we've declared inside of a subprocedure, it's only accessible from inside that subprocedure. But now I'm gonna to wanna to have two or three different subprocedures accessing that same array, so I'm gonna declare it outside of the array. Okay, so now inside this array, what I'd like to do is, is just populate that array by reading the data off of the worksheet. So let me declare a variable down here. Let me just call it r as an integer for r equals, and let me just come over here to my, I've got a sheet called distance. R is gonna start in two and go to 37. Have I named these? Oh good, I called this thing distance. So it actually has a variable named distance. So for r equals two to 37. Now I'm gonna say, I wanna, let me just do a quickly debug dot print, name of my worksheet is distance. Now is that the code name or is that the worksheet name? Yeah, it's both. I mean, if you look over here, it's probably tough to see on the video, but if you look here, it's the code name is distance and the sheet name is distance. And so that's kind of handy, but don't get confused. It's, it's, it's referring to it because it's the code name. Debug.print uh, print distance r comma one. So row r column one. This should just print off the, the names of my hotels. I'm not gonna put a, a, a do events in here because I've got a for loop. I'm not manipulating the, the variable. So it's really unlikely that I'll put that into an, in, into an infinite loop. And I'll go ahead and run this. 
Um, distance, oh, distance r, oh, distance dot cells. There we go. And maybe I'll go ahead and print r off while I'm at it. So I'm, you know, when r is two, we're looking at the this property in Los Angeles. When r is three, we're looking at this one in Salt Lake. When r is four, this one in Phoenix. Okay, but now instead of instead of writing this out, what I'd like to do, and maybe I'll just kind of do this example here. Well, let's let me let me take this outside of the loop for a minute just to kind of explore this. What I'm going to say is, I want my first my first property or my, my first variable inside my hotel array to equal this. So when when row is two column one, that has my first property name. And so how do I say the first element in the hotel array equals that? Hotel sub what? Zero equals that. Now, sometimes you think, oh, maybe I should put dot value on this because I'm putting the value. Now remember that an array is just, it's an array of variables. And variables are not objects. Variables are just values. In fact, the parallel is more like to say, well, you know, like a property in an object, that's like a variable. But a variable is not like an object, so it does not have any properties. So we don't have to say dot value or anything. We just say hotel sub zero. Now, let me just, I'm just, for the exercise, I'm gonna write four of these in. So hotel sub one is gonna read off of row number three. Hotel sub two comes off of row number four, and hotel sub uh, one, number two, and number three comes off of row number five. Okay, so I could keep going, and I could do this 36 times. But the whole point is I've got a loop to be able to do it. But now, as I look at this, what I see is, wow, these lines are all exactly the same, except for two vectors of numbers. I've got to have a vector of numbers that goes from zero to, 0 to 35, and one that goes from 2 to 37. Well, I've already set up this variable to have something that goes from 2 to 37. And so, and I'm, I'm already using that to print off this, these numbers. Oops. But now I'm going to say hotel sub something equals distance. So I need some way to make this so the first time this runs, whatever value I put here inside these parentheses is going to be zero, the second time one, two, and three, and so forth. So what do I do? What do I put here? Yeah, r minus what? Yeah, r minus two. Oops, r minus two. So now when r is two, I want this to be zero. That's, that's two minus two. When r is three, I want it to be one. That's, two minus, uh, that's three minus two four minus two, five minus two. So I'm not really gonna execute this, that's just me kind of thinking about what this problem, how this problem has to be built into the loop. Especially when I'm just kind of starting uh, with a problem that involves loops, and you're all still pretty new, well, those of you who don't have programming experience before, pretty new with loops, sometimes it's really helpful to say, all right, let me just think about, I mean, this loop's gonna execute this line multiple times, let's just write that line out multiple times and kind of look at, how does it actually have to, to look? And that can be helpful to figure that out. Okay, so now let me just, oops, I'm gonna do another loop that just prints these off. For r equals zero to 35, and now I'll just print r, hotel sub r. Am I okay to like use this same variable in two different loops? Yeah, this is a location in memory. This loop is gonna use that location in memory to keep track of its value. We get to this loop, it's gonna use this, that same location in value. By the time I get to this one, I'm done with this one, so that's not a problem. And so now that, oh, come back. Now, that should just print off the, let's see, debug dot, did something wrong here. 
debug.print R and hotel. That should now just print off 0 through 35 with the associated hotel name. There we got 0 35. That looks pretty good. All right. How are we feeling so far about the idea of a loop? I'm sorry, not a loop, an array. I mean, just show me kind of a show, a show of uh, fingers, zero through five, how comfortable you think so far arrays are. I'm seeing fours, fives, five, 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 five. Yeah, okay, but they're gonna get harder, but, but so far we're doing okay. All right, here's what I'd like to do. I would like to also create an array. Hmm. Let's take a look at how I'd like to solve this problem. So I've got a sheet here called arrays that just has some arrays that I would like to create. And we have just created and populated this first array. Now, here, I'm actually looking at a sheet. This is not an array, right? This is a range. An array is just a, it's a bunch of memory. It's a bunch of variables in memory. They are non-visual. You can't look at them. So what I would like to do here then on the route, this is where I would like to say, start in Salt Lake City. Uh, and I know, the, I know the next part. The next part is go to Las Vegas. And the next part of that, I don't know. It's somewhere in Los Angeles area. So if I had an array called route, how would I say start in Salt Lake City? What would I put right here? I could put the same thing for Salt Lake City, which is this one right here. I could actually put that text. That's here. But I don't want to be much moving that text around. Very, so it turns out that, that text variables take up a lot of memory. You know, how can I do this with less memory? Oh, yeah. Maybe I can just assign a number to each hotel. How am I going to assign the numbers? Yeah, they're already here. Right? I've got a hotel called Hotel Zero. I've got one called One, Two, and Three. So I could just drop in. I could actually here, I could say, how do we start in Salt Lake City? We say one. Now, this doesn't say, the one doesn't mean it's the first place. The one means it's Salt Lake City. How would I say start in Las Vegas? Seven. That says, that says start in Las Vegas. Because it's the first route. It's the first entry in my route array. And ultimately, I just want to have each different one of these property numbers set up here in the array. So. In class exercise, this won't take very long. Go ahead and create the route array with an appropriate type and appropriate size. Just go ahead and make, give me a dim statement that would be the right dim statement for this array that we've just described and talked about here. So give that a little thought, and hopefully you don't have to think about it for more than just a few seconds. And do we, have, do we have a volunteer who wants to tell me, you know, what did they come up with for the dim statement? I'll, I'll work the keyboard. You tell me what to type. Any volunteer? Front row, go ahead. Okay, that all looks great. With the one thing that I just want to push you on a little bit is why integer? Okay, so he's saying that the range for integer is plus or minus 32,000. What's the likelihood I'm going to have more than 32,000 routes? Or 32,000 stops on my route? It's a long route. For this problem, for sure, not. Um, what else could we possibly use? Yeah, byte might work for us too, because that's 0 through 255, so that would probably work as well. I'm going to leave it as integer here. Um, I've got something special in mind that we're going to see why integer will be helpful to us. Okay, that sounds pretty good. So now I would like to take uh, a step and talk a little bit about the way that we're declaring these. Right now, we are making this into a, this is a, what's called a static array, which means at the time that I'm writing the program, I know how many elements I want in the array. I know how many variables I want. I need, 30, I need 36 in both of these arrays. It's a static array. At the time that I'm writing the program, I know how many I need. But can you imagine a situation where we don't know how many we need when we're writing the program? 
yeah, suppose that the way this problem is going to work is that it's, it's you know, this isn't, this isn't fixed. You know, we're going to drop in a new set of distances, and we don't even know how many hotels there's going to be. And so we need to be able to figure this out dynamically. So it is possible for us to declare these as dynamic arrays. So let's take a look at how we convert these from, a, from static arrays to dynamic arrays. Is there a question over here? No? And here's how you do it. You just say, I'm not going to tell you how big. These are arrays. I've got parentheses after the declaration statement, but I'm not going to tell you how big. Remember that when we're allocating memory, that happens before any code starts running in this subprocedure. So remember, we're an interpreted language. And so when something says run this subprocedure, it says, aha, I got to allocate you know, any memory that we need. Well, because we've got these variables declared as module level variables, as soon as the first subprocedure runs, it says, oh, I got some module level variables. Let's allocate those. And then we've got to allocate any variables that we have here. And as long as we're continuously running, then these other ones will, will just hold their value in between calls to different subprocedures. So what I can't do is like have some kind of variable in here. You know, even, even if I try to do it down here. So actually, let's do this. This will not work. I'm just showing what you might be tempted to do. You might be tempted to do this. But why can't this work? This looks pretty good. You declare the variable r, you give it a value 35, and then you use that to declare this variable. Why, 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 why can this not work? It's pretty good looking code. Yeah, that's right. These dims, they're not executable. They don't actually, it's not like you get to this point and you say, ah, go declare memory. You can declare them anywhere you want inside the subprocedure, but when this subprocedure compiles, it says, hey, we're, how, much, how many dim statements do we have here? We've got to allocate all that memory up front, and then we start running. So even though this one appears below it, this line gets processed before this line. That's the reason that you cannot put a breakpoint on a dim statement. You can't you click all you want over here. You can't set a breakpoint there because this thing doesn't, it doesn't execute. It gets processed before execution of the subprocedure begins. So this is no good. So let me go ahead and put this back up. So if I want to make this dynamic, I say declare it without telling how many variables there are. And then I'll do something to figure out what I want R to be. And now I will say redim hotel sub R. When I redim, I do not say the type again. I've already told it what the type is. I can't change that. Redim is an executable line. So I can redim route to this as well. Shall we leave R as a fixed value here or should we, should we actually put code to calculate it? It's not too hard to calculate. Should we calculate it? Let's make this to be a, we'll start off by making a range. We'll use the kind of range where I give it two cells. The cell that I want to start with is on my distance worksheet. We're just going to assume that we have the same structure. So we'll always start in A2. So distance.range A2. So I'm doing a multidimensional range starting at this place and ending at whatever place I would be if I was on A2 and said, and XL down. This range now, with the code that we have right now, this range will be A2 through A37. It'll be that, that range in column A. Now, I, this is an integer. I got to get this to be a number. So how am I going to get that to be the right number? Well, let me just ask for the count of the cells in there. Count large? I don't even know what count large means. So I'm going to say start in this place, do end down, refer to that whole range. Right? This one says, I'm making a range. 
I'm telling it a range to start in. I'm telling it how to get to the cell that we end in. And that will be that whole range. I'm asking for the count. That should put 30. Oh, that should put 36. That should put 30. That should put 36. But what I really want, I want that count minus one. Because if the range has 36 elements, I want to declare this as with 35 as the top index because I'm picking up zero. Yeah. Oh, does the A2 have to have quotes around it? Yeah, you're sitting kind of far in the back, so it must be pretty tough to see those quotes. Let me, uh, I'll use a different font to darken those, those uh, quotes in for you. Thank you. Okay. Let's just run this and make sure that it still works now that we've made these into dynamic arrays. Still works great, that's wonderful. A little more complicated than how we started off, but still not too bad. This isn't, this, isn't, this isn't too bad. We're about to make it too bad. You ready? So we've kind of peeked at this visualization of these arrays. So now I've created this array here as well. Now we've got to do this array. This is what's called a two-dimensional array. So instead of just having one long list of variables, I've got variables that I'm going to kind of think of as being in rows and columns. Now, these variables in the array, they're not in rows and columns. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at them and thinking about them as being in rows and columns, but they're just, they're just different slots in memory. But the idea here is that if I want to think about this as a grid, I can declare this as two dimensions. I mean, I could just declare it as one, one long vector that is 35 times 35 long. And it would, or 36 times 36 long, and that would give me the same number of variables. But if I declare it as a two dimensional array, now I can visualize it as two dimensions. I can say, you know, give me row, you know, I'm looking at my array, give me row five, column three, or column seven, and I'd be talking about that variable right there. And so this is a kind of a different way to get at the total number of variables I want but this will give me a way to access them using two indices instead of one. Let's go ahead and declare that one as well. I'm gonna dim distance. Hmm. Distance is the name of a worksheet, so I don't think I like that. I'm gonna just call it dist. I'm gonna dim dist as, what type should it be? Probably single. I've got dest, oh. Uh, I've, tr I've trimmed these off so that this is easier to see, but when I look at my distance sheet, oh, I trimmed these off too. I didn't remember doing that. So integer will be fine for this as well. But if I had decimal points in there, I'd want to have it as a single precision floating point number. And now, Here's how, let me go ahead and do this first as a static array. To do two dimensions, I do it like this, 35. That gives me something really similar, just like this first, gives me this kind of this first area here. But I wanna do that 36 times. So I just put a comma and a 35 here. Because I've declared this with two indices, I now get 35, or 36 times 36 variables, but it maintains this notion of having two, to two indices that I use to refer to it by. So instead of doing that there, I'm gonna make this a dynamic array and then I will redim it. Redim happens the same way. So I will redim dist r comma r. Question? Could you have three dimensions? Yes. Um, you just, in that place, you kind of have to think of it as a cube, right? right? So I've got this, and then I can think there's another dimension that goes deep. Could I have four dimensions? Yes. It's kind of hard to visualize. But yeah, you can have as many dimensions as you want. I remember solving a problem once where I went, I was kind of racking my head about how to solve this problem, and I finally went, oh, it's a six dimension array. And that was exactly what I needed. I needed an array with six dimensions. And it was like, oh, the whole problem was easy to solve once I realized that was the structure I needed to make it, make it go easy. 
but it's kind of tough to think about. How, do you, how would you think about a four-dimension array? How would you kind of visualize it? The way I do it is I say, well, I've got the cube, and then inside each cell, I've got a list. The fourth dimension is another list inside the cell. Five-dimension array, inside each cell, there's a spreadsheet. The six-dimension array, inside each cell of the cube, there's another cube that has a, another set of indices that gets to that particular location. And you can, the, there might be some limit, like 32 or something, but I don't want you to do a 32 dimension array, but I don't know what the li limit is. Okay. Questions? Okay, here's what I'd like to do. I would like to actually get our other two, our other two, um, arrays populated. Let's talk about the route. Now that we've got this declared, let's talk about this route array. Now, uh, um, I forgot which one of you two gave us the algorithm. Was it you? Okay. So you told us we are going to start in Salt Lake City. I'll start in Salt Lake City. One. Just put that in here. And now from Salt Lake City, we need to go to the array, the, the nearest hotel that we haven't been to yet. Now this is a little deceiving because the way we see it here is like it's blank. But because this is an integer, is it blank? Can you make an integer blank? What's the valid range for integer? Plus or minus roughly 32,000 and blank? No, no, yeah, it only holds numbers. And so when I create this, and, and we have, we've, we've built this array, what's actually here? Zero. So this is really a bunch of zeros in here. All right, so now that I'm starting here in Salt Lake and the rest of my, can I just copy that down? And the rest of my properties all have zero here. How do I, how do I ask, have I been to Salt Lake? How can I look at this array and say, answer the question, have I been to Salt Lake? Yeah, you're saying, look through the, look through the route. How, so have I been to Salt Lake? Yes. Have I been to Las Vegas yet? No, Las Vegas number seven. Seven's not in there. Have I been to the Sheridan in Los Angeles? Look at the problem. Have I been to the Sheridan in Los Angeles? I have been, even though I don't mean to have been there, right? It's a kind of a coincidence of how this thing gets initialized. Because I have a hotel number zero, and this thing starts with zeros, I'm saying I've already been to Los Angeles. And so if the way that I'm going to tell have I been there is by looking at my route array, I got a problem if I start with Los Angeles. So I probably should put a bunch of, I should, I should probably initial, maybe I made a guess. Maybe you want to start with these variables all being zero. No, I don't. Good guess, but that's a problem for me. So what number should I put in there? Okay, so negative one. Why negative one? Yeah, my lowest one's always gonna be zero. What's my biggest one? Well, 35 for this problem, but next time it could be 37. You know, my other reasonable choice um, for, to, to start this off was, so negative one is good, I like it. That's the one we'll do, we'll do, because it's simple. My other one is 32,768, is the very largest number could possibly fit in there. Um, I like negative one better. So I would like to see negative one, all the way through this. So talk to me over here in code, how am I gonna put negative one into every single slot of my, of my route array to start this thing off? What, in all this great code that I have here, how am I gonna do it? I've already answered a couple questions today. You've got it figured out. Someone else kind of stretch, make a reach for it, go ahead. So you're saying, come here, put route sub r equals negative one. Yeah. So here I'm when 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 r is zero, this is going to put route sub zero is negative one. Route sub one is negative one. Route sub two is negative one. I like it, except that whole printing. I, I may actually throw that loop away. This one I got to keep. So let me come in here and put r minus two equals negative one. 
you know, here's where I'm plugging in my hotel names. Here's where I'm putting in my initial, my initial values for that route. So at this point, I have built now both of these two arrays. In fact, let me go ahead and put a breakpoint here. And I'm going to run this code up to this point. I N T E G E R. All right, now what is some tool that I could use here to kind of look at the variables that I have in memory? We talked about it last time we were together. The locals window. So I'll choose view locals. Here's module one. Okay, so I have, let's kind of look at the way this is. Let me zoom in here. Okay, so here in my local variable, in my, in my, Sub procedure I'm in right now, I have R. Maybe I should make this a little bit narrower. I'll, I'll zoom out by one level. So. There we go. So I've got R and the value is 38. But now I've got some variables that are declared at the module level. So even though it says at the locals window, it shows my local variables, I also can see my module level variables. And here they are. Let's take a look at hotel. I'll open up hotel. And here's Hotel Sub Zero is Sheridan, Los Angeles. Hotel Sub One, Sheridan City Center in Salt Lake and so forth. So I can see these now populated here in memory. I should be able to look at distance and see it's all a bunch of negative, I'm sorry, as route, it's all a bunch of negative ones. We've got that all filled in the way that we want it to be. So see how that locals window can be kind of nice? Let me just check and see, you know, how we're thinking. Now, of course, to be able to see anything in the locals window, the code has to be running. It has to be suspended. So I've got to be in break mode which is, and I can tell I'm in break mode because I've got the yellow line here. Red line says, hey, when you run this, take me into break mode. But when I'm in break mode, I've got that yellow line indicating this is where we are. We've stopped here for some reason. Could be because we had an error, could be because we had a break point, could be because we stepped into the procedure, but we, those all three things will get us into break mode. Okay, now for the challenging part of our work today is to fill up this, this distance array. So, um, we could actually build it into this same loop, but I think we're gonna, we're gonna make a completely separate loop for this one for us. I may even create a different variable instead of R. Well, row and column, yeah, let me go ahead and declare another variable up here called C as an integer. So ultimately, I'm gonna to have to have, I mean, I can use just one variable to refer to this elements in this array, but because I have a two-dimensional array here, I'm gonna need two variables. So I'll use R and C kind of row and column for this. All right, so after we have done this variable, let's go ahead and make another loop right here. For R equals, and I think, in this case, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use R and C to refer to my array. Here, I used R to, ref, to be a direct reference to my worksheet, and then I adjusted it for my array. I think on this next one, I'm gonna use R to go directly to the array, and then I'll adjust to get to the worksheet. So for R equals zero to, hmm. now, we actually calculated how big that needs to be here, and we dumped it into R. But then we've changed what R's value is here. So I no longer have R reminding me of how big this array is. But here's the good news, is that I can ask an array what its upper boundary is. And so for R is gonna equal from zero to the upper boundary of my route, or my hotel would work just as fine. It would work the same because they're the same size. So U bound is just a function that tells me what's the upper boundary. Okay, so now I've got this loop that, in fact, I think I want to go across the columns first. So let's do this way. I'll do C. And so what I'm going to do is ultimately we'll have to nest this loop, but let's get started just going right across 
the top here pulling in these numbers. So we're going to go from zero to the upper boundary from zero to 35. I'm going to say route row number zero. We'll come back and extend this a little bit. Column number C is going to equal, looking at our distance sheet, row number, now when R is two, actually let's just hard code this in, two. So I'm going, to be, I'm going to be looking down row number two right here. But when column is zero, I want to be looking at column number two here. That's, if I think about this being the array I'm working with, this being my whole worksheet, when I'm referring to column number zero in my worksheet, it's column number two. So this is going to be column C plus two. So the first time through this loop, would it be helpful to kind of to kind of stretch this out and look at these with fixed numbers and kind of see them grow, or are we are we comfortable just with a loop this way? Comfortable? Question. Oh, thank you so much. This should be dist. Yeah, we're we're trying to fill up that two dimensional distance array. Thank you. All right, so let's see, I have a, so a breakpoint here. I'm gonna stop my code. I'm gonna run it again. And so now we've got our distance array here. And I think what I wanna do is I wanna add this as a watch. And let's see if I can get my watch window just to float here. So it's not so large. So I should be able to kind of look at this thing. Control Windows Plus. Is that big enough? Okay, so what I'm seeing is the outside distance here. So here's my first, this is the kind of the first row. These are all the rows of my array. Here's my first row and I've put those values in. 0, 691, 374, 385 and so forth. What should I see if I look at my second row of my array? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't put anything in there. I've just gone across that first row. So now, Windows, mine's my friends. So now I want this to happen a whole bunch of times. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna wrap that inside another loop. For r equals zero to the upper boundary and next. So now instead of always looking at row number zero, I'm gonna look at row number r here. And instead of looking at two, I'm gonna look at r plus two. And now if I run that, I should see this array with a lot more information in it. Yeah, we, we declared C up here. We're setting its value here. And row is one, column is one. I'm looking for three, three. Do I have something in here? It should be that cell right there. There just might've been something in there that I didn't like. Let's see what this value actually is. blank. I think I must have had a space in there or something because I deleted it. But the truth is, we don't really need to look down the diagonal. Right now, we're looking down this diagonal. Right? We're actually looking when they're the same. You remember that when it defaulted to zero, that was a problem for my route array. But what's the actual value? It's not shown on this worksheet, but what's the value that really is here logically? Yeah, that's the distance between this property and this, but it's the same property. This one that is zero. So it turns out that our, our starting value is really 
I mean, the default value is what we want there. So how do I change this so that I don't actually look at zero? So C is not going to be, yeah, C, let's start this one off at one, because then I would first start, my first column is going to be C plus two, it's going to be three. That'll be this first place that I'm reading from. I've already got the value that I'm putting here in my array. Yep. Um, you're using that C in your list array. You're skipping zero the first time through. Yeah, the, the comment is here, oh, but if you do that, you're going to be skipping zero the first time through. And that's exactly what I want to do. Because if I think of this, this part right here as being my array, I've already got a zero sitting right here. Because it's a numeric data type. The zero is already there. And so this is really the first one that I need to read. So let's think about how if I, if I go through this, we're coming down here, R is zero, C is one. The first value I'm gonna write to is row zero, column one. And I'm gonna put in that value. And then I'm gonna loop right here on this loop till this one's done. C goes up by one, C goes up by one, C goes up by one, all the way until C is 35. It finishes, we hit next, and then what happens? Yeah, R goes to one, so now I'm gonna start working on this one. So R goes to one, C goes back to one. Whew, do I want it to go to one? Where do I want it to go? The second time this loop, where do I want it to start? I, I always want it to start one further than my row is. So instead of this being one, it's gonna be R plus one. So when R is zero, when I'm on row number zero, I'm gonna start on column one and go across. When row is two, I'm gonna start on column three and go across. When row is four, I'm gonna start on this one and go across. Okay, hey, that looks great. I'm gonna run this to my breakpoint, and then we'll go snoop around and see what we've got inside our dist array. Before I looked at dist one, here, or dist zero, dist one, yeah, we, we don't have values in the first two, and then we've got a bunch of numbers. Next one, first three are blank, and then a bunch of numbers. Next one, first four are blank, and then a bunch of numbers. This looks pretty good. Well, they're not blank, they're zeros, because that's the default value in there. <sighs> Only one more thing to do to get the, the problem set up. And we, we saw a lot of work to do to solve the problem, but we're still just trying to get the problem set up. And that is, if I look at this, Control, oh no, Windows minus, here we go. If I look at this, why is this side of the array or this side of the data blank? How come this table doesn't have that filled in? Yeah, it's a, it's a mirror image. So this tells me the distance, the distance between this Phoenix property and the Salt Lake property. What is this one? Distance between the Salt Lake property and the Phoenix property. Those are the same. Sometimes when you see these tables, there they show miles in one and kilometers in the other. So you know, pick the, pick the one that you want, but you, all the information is in just one half of, the, half of the table. So what this means is that we don't really need to populate these variables in our array. But now that would make solving the problem more difficult because now if I need this, let's say I'm in Salt Lake. Uh, Salt Lake's not a very good example. Let's say I'm in Las Vegas. Number seven, where's Las Vegas? Las Vegas right here. So I've got to figure out what the distances are to all my other properties. And so how do I find that out? I have to look down this part of the array until I get to the diagonal, and then I got to switch and look across this part. Could we do that with code? We could totally do that with code. But wouldn't it be better is if these values We're sitting right here. So all I have to do is go right across this row. The only, if, it's, if these are all filled in, the only row, when I'm in Las Vegas, the only row I care about is this row right here. I'm gonna say go across that row and find out what all the distances are and find the shortest one. Not too bad. And, and the truth is, this array is square. Those, those, that memory is already allocated. It's already being used as much as zeros. We might as well fill it in. 
Oh, it would be so much easier if this was already filled in and we could just read it. That would be really easy. But how are we going to change our code so that when we put this 300 here, we also put that 300 in? What's that? Oh, so what you're saying is we could just actually come in here and, and, and just actually put this equals this. This equals this, this equals this. It would get really ugly. And plus, we're thinking this data comes in, I don't want to do that every time I solve the problem. Question or suggestion over here? Ah, so let's look at it here. The, the comment is maybe we could just switch the indices. So this, if I look at here, I'm just go with the, this is, let's see I, that's column nine, row eight. This one is, Column eight, row nine. Uh, let's just check one more. This one is column seven, row nine. And its analogous one is right here, row seven, column nine. Yeah. So what you're saying is that I could fill that whole array just by reversing these two, or incidentally, it's a little bit cleaner. I mean, I just put that into that location. Let's just reverse it here. Whoops. I just put that one in. Let's, let's do this one. Row C, column R. It's a little weird to say it that way. We're just taking the opposite. We're, we're saying the number you just put here, put it into the analogous part of the array. I'll run that. We'll now take a look at this. Ah. So now when I look here, I've got the 37, 635, zero on the diagonal. And then let's just check those. This is our third row, 374, 653, zero, 012. Three seventy four six sixty three zero twelve. Yeah, so we've got those values in there, and we can snoop around and see that that's all there. So at this point, we've got the problem set up. We've got all of our pieces now in the memory, and we're ready to start solving. By the way, a big part of the problem here is going to be figuring out how to find the next, find the smallest number. I've got to go across this row and find the smallest number, and that's actually your next homework assignment. So we'll see how to solve that in class next Monday. I encourage you to. You know, give that some thought. Maybe don't spend too long. It's, it's probably one of the more difficult homeworks. You know, don't kill yourself on this homework assignment, but give us some thought so that when we get together on Monday, you're kind of ready to go. All right, folks, thanks for coming. Class dismissed.